Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Today we're gonna to be going over Twitter, looking and seeing what people are talking about, what they're sharing. And obviously I'm gonna interject my opinions, uh, financial opinions, that is, uh, across the board of whatever re we are reading. Uh, if you wanna follow me, you can follow me at finding underscore finance. And if you want to join our community, it's finding value.com. You can use discount in the coupon code if you want a discount. And we do have a Saturday, 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time uh, question and answer session for the members. So uh, I like what this guy says. We used to talk about this back in the day. He says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And punch in the face, you can basically interchange that with market volatility. Everyone has a plan until their account values go down. Everyone has a plan until they see volatility in their account. And here's the thing, guys. Volatility is going to come to your account no matter what. Uh, it, it will happen in any market condition. Uh, those with the most experience, like Peter Lynch, Warren Buffett, all these guys, you know what they tell you? Don't try to time the market uh, in the short term. What they do is they buy value. And that's where the value is. You want to identify where the value is. You're going to get market volatility any way you cut this. And you're going to have to ride through it if you want the big gains. Everybody says they're willing to take on all the risk in the world until the volatility punches them in the face. Then they start questioning things. Is the thesis right? Are we in a commodity bull market? They start questioning absolutely everything. And what you have to do is you need to study up and say, this is where the value is. This is the fundamentals of, the, of that sector or of that market that you are investing in. And I'm going to ride through the volatility of whatever that is in the short term. I mean, volatility is great when it works in your favor. Volatility is a punch to the face when it's not working in your favor. And, and I'm sure people are like, well, how do you handle it? You're going to have to get used to it. That is a part of the game. That is part of investing. And if you want 20, 30 baggers, the way that I handle it is I don't allocate as much money to those sectors. Um, I, I hedge myself. I guess, psychologically, by how much I deploy in some of these sectors. That is how I'm handling it. And I think if you can't handle the volatility, you're probably putting too much money into it. Remember, I've got a lot of money in physical metals, and I continue to pile into those things. And I've got dividend-paying stocks that are paying out dividends. And then you've got your small speculative companies that you're swinging for the fence for, or at least trying to get triples with so to speak. Uh, we've got the lowest number of S&P 500 stocks beating the market, SPY, since March 2000. The reason I wanted to share this is March 2000. That's the bottom of the commodity bull market. This is the bottom of the commodity bull market. And yep, when it's low, that's when people have already sold out. The money is out of the stocks. So that's that's the percent S&P 500 stocks beating the index, and it's at a very low level. And guess what comes next? Generally, a bottom and a turn at some point. We are at an extreme level to the downside. That is when you want to get bullish, not bearish. My take on it. Here's one. He says, a person could be a millionaire but not have enough cash flow to pay their bills. A person could have 500,000 net worth and enough cash flow to pay their bills. Cash flow is greater than net worth. Well, I'm going to say this. I would rather have a much higher net worth than a cash flow because net worth, you can always reconfigure your net worth to generate large cash flow. If all you have is cash flow and no net worth, you can go bankrupt. So I would disagree with this. Net worth is far more valuable than cash flow. You can generate cash flow, but you could be on the brink of bankruptcy if you go and you rent a bunch of homes that you purchased with little money down. You've got good cash flow, but you don't have the equity. You don't have the net worth. The net worth, you can't go bankrupt because you're rich. 
by definition, so to speak. And you can always generate more cash flow with a bunch of net worth. That's my take on it. Um, here's one. It says, holy, sm holy smokes, this bond market is on the edge of a crash. Look at the UK gilt. Um, our bond market is very similar to this one in terms of the way that this thing looks. You can draw a trend line coming up. We've broken that trend line back test and it's been coming down and we've been moving sideways for a little bit, but it's starting to break to the downside. We're also seeing that in the United States bond market. So these bond markets, interest rates are really starting to move to the upside and perhaps we're seeing cracks in the system. They're probably trying to hold this all together by keeping precious metals down through paper contracts. Um, good luck. That's all I'm going to say. Good luck. Uh, you can't hold this down forever. Um, I thought this was interesting because a lot of people continually talk about um, these big market, house market crashes. And, they, and these guys come on and they always say the crash is coming, da, 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 da. This was back from 2022 when Robert Kiyosaki predicted the housing collapse. He also stated the best investment is cans of tuna fish. Ignore the noise and the gurus, buy good deals and hold them long term. I actually completely agree with this. <clears throat> the only thing you can control in a market is when you purchase an asset. And what you can do is you can find undervalued assets and buy them when they're undervalued. Then you hold for the long term. That's been the most successful strategy that every single billionaire stock market investor has basically given. Um, they've also say when you find a big trend, you buy low and then you have to ride it for a long time. You ride that big trend. That is where the big money is made. That's from Jesse Livermore. We've got Peter Lynch saying the same thing. Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, on and on and on. Howard Marks. It just keeps going, guys. Uh, so find the value in the market. Find where there are problems that need to be solved in the market. And those that are the biggest problems uh, that get solved are going to be the most rewarding um, most of the time. Because money flows where the problems are or where the biggest challenges need to be solved. Um, this is the long view. Uh, you know how to invest. This is the gold divided by S&P 500 ratio. Uh, and when we look at this chart, you can see that we are at very low levels. We are at levels similar to early 2000s. So what do you do in that time frame? You buy it and you freaking hold. That is it. You hold, you hold, and then you hold. And then you buy more and you hold longer. Why? Because if you're buying in the mid 60s here, yeah, it felt bad to wait um, five, six, seven years. But guess what? When this came to an overvalued state, if you held physical gold and physical silver, your average return, depending on how you how you allocated that, would be twenty plus times your money. You'd be you'd be over thirty times your money, depending on how you allocated it and where you bought in this bottom here. And yes, you held for five or six years, and it didn't go anywhere. So what? You can't beat that. This is a lifetime of returns in a ten year period. So you better you better figure out how to value stocks. You better figure out how to value commodities. And then you better figure out psychologically how to hold them. I'm in there. I'm buying assets because they're cheap. Are we going to see volatility in the short term? Oh, yes, we are. Is the thesis broken? No, it's not. A lot of people are arguing where we are at in the thesis, not if the thesis is broken. The thesis is correct. They're arguing where we're at. In my opinion, we have not built the homes for the market to be in a hyper supply phase. And we will at some point build those homes where we do get into a hyper supply phase. We're not there yet, guys. And we've got a long way for gold and a lot of these commodities to appreciate against other financial assets in this market. And it could happen very quickly. It, it, it turned up a little bit and then a lot happened very quickly. And yeah, we had, a, we had a wicked pullback. And I think that we are actually earlier than what most people think. I don't think that this was the first, well, it could have been the first leg. And then it, it's going to launch from there. It's going to be nice if you're in it and you can wait and be patient enough. Uh, this is, uh, again, this is similar. So this is the gold to S&P 500 ratio. 
Uh, what this one is, this is the gold to M2 money supply. And the way that this turns and, and goes up is under certain market conditions. Um, those conditions occur generally under an inflationary period where a demographic comes into home buying years and it's a larger blah, 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 the entire thesis. So we are very low and this is, has a long way to move up. So that's gold versus M2 money supply. All commodities are indexed to gold. Gold is our leader. Gold is our inflation measuring stick. And when money comes rotating back into commodities and precious metals, it is signaling that the market conditions are ripe for that to happen. We are at, I think, a very low level, which is ready to move on up. We also see an alignment with um, a, a large supply reduction in gold, which also happened at the same time of every bull market in gold. So we've, we've got these underinvestment cycles tied with the credit expansion cycle, and they're going to overlap here uh, over the next decade. Um, this guy said, I retired at 35 by working regular jobs and ignoring what most people, most gurus tell you. These are 13 unpopular facts of life that will make you a millionaire. So let's go over them. It says company loyalty will make you poor. He says, screw the 3% cost of living raise. Basically, you need to switch employers every three to four years and get a 20% raise each time. He says, most millionaires are self-made. Yes, we all get help, but the vast majority don't inherit our wealth. It's proven. So rich people, they start businesses, they invest in real estate, they invent a new product. They provide value. And look at this. They invest in real estate. Think about that for a second. Getting rich is a habit. Habits are the things we do without thinking about them. Rich people habits are, they rarely complain, they think long-term, they have tangible goals, they know that time is money, diet and exercise regularly. Four, your significant other will make or break you. I am where I am today because of the person I married. The, the right spouse will support you in your goals, not stand in your way, took until I was 33 to find the right person. So this person, if they made a million by 35 or retired by 35, they mainly did it by themselves, and then they basically um, got married later on in this particular case. Very few rich people are addicted to the news. The news is designed to make you upset, angry, fearful. None of these emotions would help us build wealth. Rich people are too busy getting rich to worry about the day's manufactured drama. Making money is easy. There are 22 million millionaires in the U.S. Money is everywhere. All you need to do is identify a skill that you have that people want to pay for. All of us have marketable skills. Rich people identify them, use them, and monetize them. You don't need to hustle 24-7. Burnout doesn't help you get rich. It makes you less effective. Burnout means poor decisions, more fatigue, less motivation, and crappy sleep. Proper rest and sleep mean you can push harder during the day. Growing up poor doesn't mean you're screwed. It might be tougher for you. But that also means your success will mean more to you. There are enough rags to riches stories these days to prove that growing up poor won't kill your chances of getting rich. Money doesn't play favorites. If you live in a first world country, you have insane access to all kinds of money. Money is everywhere. Side hustles, business loans, government handouts. People want to pay you. You just need to let them. Investing is not gambling. With gambling, your odds suck. Investments, however have a clear and direct history of making a lot of people filthy rich over time. It's not your salary. It's not your savings. It's not your upbringing. It's your investments. You have more opportunities today than anyone in history. You have people that have, it's never been easier for scholarships, mentorships, the internet, cell phones. Excuses don't make people rich. Take advantage of opportunities. Passions don't pay the bills. Generally, your strengths pay the bills, but not your passions. Passions are more creative, strengths are more marketable. Follow your strengths, then pursue your passions without worrying about earning a full-time income from them. A designer degree won't make you rich. The best decision I've ever made was going to college. The second best was choosing an inexpensive state school. The facts, go to state, go in state, start at a community college, choose a highly marketable degree. You'll do fine. I spent a lot of time writing these threads. If you liked it, da 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 da. So those are some uh, information or some opinions from a millionaire. Uh, welcome to the full employment recession. I thought that was funny. 
Germany plunged into recession with quarter one GDP shrink uh, 0.3 quarter to quarter after minus 0.5 in quarter four 2022. Unemployment rate remains stable at 5.7. What's behind the paradox here? What is going on? And I don't really know, guys. I, I mean, it is a weird situation, and we're seeing anomalies in prices, even in the housing market, where things have gone down under six months of supply. That is an anomaly. Um, here is something very interesting. The short end of the yield curve, and I talk about this in our, our daily commodity updates, the one-month yield through 6%. Look at this thing just rocket to the upside. We could be undergoing a problem with our bond market. Um, and we'll see if it if it's tied to the debt ceiling or not. But um, you know, platinum, gold, physical silver, all pretty cheap. And if we're having problems with bonds, that money is rotating out of there pretty quick. It says I gather the problem the global oil industry now faces is that it has to replace 10 to 11 million barrels per day of oil every single year due to the natural decline rate. So new oil discoveries are like interest on a massive debt payment, not really going to stop the coming decline. So here's global oil production. There's your estimated annual decline rate. And we're at 10.5 million barrels per day per year. What that means is that we have to find a new Saudi Arabia every single year to stay flat in oil production. I don't know if that's possible. I really don't know about that. Here's gold to U.S. debt, another uh, ratio chart looking ready to break out. Um, and this is the stuff that I focus on, guys. I focus on the charts. I focus on what is undervalued, and gold is incredibly undervalued, along with commodities. Here's another one. The most expensive things about raising kids is not required. Your kids don't need a larger house or a big brand new SUV. They don't care. All your kids need is you your time, your love, and your wisdom. And I do agree with that. Um, I don't have a brand new SUV. I don't have anything. We have old cars because cars depreciate. And I think that the kids, I mean, our kids don't care at all about what car we have or anything. So yeah, this is 100% true. And uh, I'm going to ride those cars until they're done. And then I'll buy uh, used cars or get cars from family members that they don't want to use anymore because I just don't want to pay uh, for a new car, and I don't want to pay for the registration. I don't want to pay for the insurance. I don't want to pay for anything for it, to be honest. I already have the cars I really like. Uh, silver miners have hugely underperformed both metals and gold miners lately. Uh, wherever gold and silver bottoms this time around, it should be the final low before we see new gold all time highs. From that low, I think the revaluation of silver miners will start. I agree with this. And wherever we bottom out here, I think that's the last low that we're going to see. I completely agree with him. Uh, and I think he's uh, right, right on the money there. Um, this is Shabam. It says, OPEC Plus showing an intense commitment to voluntary cuts with seaborne crude exports down 3.4 million barrels per day last week versus April average. Saudi Arabia in particular is tightening the screws with their exports down 1.7 million barrels per day. Versus just five weeks ago. Trend is your friend, invest accordingly. We've got a decline in cargo volume of, uh, of oil. Now, this is going to take time to get to the United States. It's going to take time to hit inventory. So, this is coming. It's not here yet. We have an opportunity, I think, for investment there. Here's our foreign holdings of US Treasuries just reached the lowest level in 19 years. Look at this thing go down, guys. Foreign holders are dumping. U.S. Treasuries as a percent of total debt. Uh, so that's what I've got for today, guys. That's where I'm going to end it. A um, lot of information there. And that's where we are in this cycle. Uh, we're getting some pullbacks. I think the debt ceiling uh, is just rocketing those interest rates higher. And um, it's having impact on all of the uh, stock market. So um, that's where we're at. That's where I'm going to leave it. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the website if you guys like and join our community. Um, the value there is those midweek updates and the uh, question and answer sessions that we go, go over. I also put a lot of information on the website as well if you guys want to, uh, want to research it. So that's what I've got. Uh, we'll catch you later. This is Finding Value.